Welcome back to the School of the U.S. Constitution's Presentation of Constitutional Homeland Security by Dr. Edwin Vieira, Jr. Before we continue, let's review Part 1, in which we read how America's integrity has been compromised by criminal gangster politicians and the special interests which pull their strings. It's become commonplace for the limits on governmental power to be skirted using the excuse of a, quote, state of emergency to accrue, quote, emergency powers, a concept which wholly and directly contradicts and violates the Constitution of the United States itself. As a result, America is devolving from a free republic of sovereign citizens into a surveillance and police state of debt serfs who lack the self-reliance which the Constitution was framed to promote. The corrupt politicians heading the police state have illegally accrued their power under the guise of creating, seek, of creating security in response to never-ending threats such as terrorism, which has caused the scope of government to expand to tyrannical proportions, ignoring that the Constitution itself was crafted in a state of emergency, and that even according to the Supreme Court, no emergency, crisis, or any other dire event can create powers for the government outside of those already enumerated within the Constitution, or legally amended to it. And neither can any such Constitution free the government of its purposefully imposed disabilities and restraints. These corrupt politicians ignore or belittle the fact that the Constitution states very clearly that well-regulated militias provide the security of free states, not standing armies or government departments under any name and that, by law, those aged 18 and over comprise the militia. So, how do we take our security out of the hands of corrupt politicians, of corrupt public officials, and restore it to the people? If anything will be done, common Americans will do it. We can count on no one else. Continuing with Part 2 of Chapter 1. Fortunately, Americans ourselves, as the Constitution denominates us in its most important words, we the people, are entitled and even required to and even required to take charge in the situation. We the people are particularly qualified to do so for at least five reasons. One, both the immediate and the long range goal of homeland security must be the maintenance of popular self government. As the Constitution itself declares in its preamble, and as President Abraham Lincoln reminded this country in his Gettysburg Address, America's is a government of the people themselves. We the people of the United States, not any elected officials, bureaucrats, judges, political parties or personalities or selfish special interest groups, do ordain and establish a Constitution in the United States of America. Moreover, it is a government for the people, created in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. And therefore, it is and must always remain a government by the people, self-government in all things most particularly the programs of homeland security upon which its survival depends, and not simply in principle but also in actuality. True enough, we the people generally administer the legislative, executive, and judicial branches of the general government and the states, not directly through, participatory, through participatory democracy, but through representatives. This, however, is not a course enjoined by the nature of a republican government, for in the militia the people perform a critical governmental function directly, but merely a procedure born of practicality in an extensive country. Certainly, the individuals selected from time to time for public office inherently enjoy, and historically have exhibited, no particular personal merits that set them above we the people as to warrant them to rule rather than simply to represent common Americans. They are no more than mere agents, not principles. That being so, 
We the people's representatives can claim no license, let alone a prerogative, to, substi to substitute their own idiosyncratic notions of, quote, homeland security for the people's standards, or to presume that they alone, to the exclusion of the people, are capable of designing and putting into effect an adequate program of, quote, homeland security on that basis, or to secure the facts pertinent to, or to, or to make secret the facts pertinent to the people's evaluation of their representatives' performances in that field under the blanket of national security or any other question-baying rubric, and thereby to deny the people the information they need to perform the tasks necessary to self-govern. 2. The means transcending all others to achieve homeland security must be preservation of the Constitution. And over this constitution, we the people must assert and actually exercise supreme authority. At base, the challenge confronting common Americans is either to stand up and enforce their constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic, or to stand by and watch their country be destroyed as the constitution is systematically circumvented, subverted, and eviscerated and the misrule of lawlessness paradoxically enforced by police violence descends upon them. For the root cause of each and every menace to homeland security that now threatens the United States traces to unconstitutional actions by particular identifiable office holders at the local, state, and national levels, whether elected representatives, bureaucrats, or judges. The perpetrator's threadbare excuse for this situation is that, America's suppo is that America supposedly operates under a so-called, quote, living constitution, which public officials claim the exclusive authority to interpret, that is, to make up as they go along. The reality, though, is otherwise. That as the preamble asserts, we the people do ordain and establish this constitution in the present tense, not simply have ordained, not simply have ordained it once upon a time in the past. It asserts an authority both continuous and contemporary as well as complete. We the people now living are just as responsible for the Constitution today as were our forebearers when they ratified it in 1788. And because we the people do ordain and establish this constitution as our creation, we necessarily are always superior to it, as well as to every public official to whom we may temporarily delegate limited powers as our agent under the constitution. So we the people, being the creators of the constitution, without any other human being's permission or assistance, the Constitution being the supreme law of the land, and the law being, in Blackstone's words, a rule of civil conduct prescribed by the supreme power in a state, commanding what is right and prohibiting what is wrong, therefore we the people are, to the fullest extent of human competence, the ultimate source and executors of the supreme law of the land. In particular, because we the people do ordain and establish this Constitution, and alone may amend it in either our state legislatures or conventions, we the people also determine what the Constitution actually means, and whether public servants are properly construing and, and applying it. For the power to enact carries with it final authority to declare the meaning of the legislation and we the people's construction of the Constitution binds every public official. For, as Blackstone taught, whenever a question arises between the society at large and any magistrate vested with powers, originally delegated by that society, it must be decided by the voice of the society itself. There is not upon earth any other tribunal to resort to. Otherwise, the mere agents could define their own authority in defiance of their principles or the originators, thereby setting the political order upside down. For the people to govern ourselves, we ourselves must interpret our own supreme law with authority and finality. If public officials interpret the law, 
then they rule the people. Even more pressing, when we the people's public servants, non-feasance, non misfeasance, and malfeasance imperils homeland security, and can be, and can be seasonally and can be seasonably rectified in no other manner, we the people must take upon ourselves the actual execution of our constitution. As the constitution itself impliedly recognizes when it empowers the militia to execute the laws of the Union, and imposes on Congress the duty to provide for calling them forth for that very service whenever necessary. If the situation imperatively demands that the militia be called forth immediately to execute the laws of the Union, but if Congress, for whatever reason, neglects, fails, or refuses to make adequate provision for that purpose, and if the several states shirk their responsibilities in this regard, then are the laws to remain unexecuted and the Union to suffer anarchy and possible dissolution as a result? Or are we the people who are embodied in the militia not entitled to do what Congress and the states should have done, and to call ourselves forth to perform the mission which the Constitution requires of us? Preservation of the Constitution is self-evidently necessary to secure what it calls a republican form of government, in which it commands that the United States shall guarantee to every state of the Union. Self-evidently, too, the Constitution would not require the United States to guarantee that every state in the Union has a republican form of government, unless states of such character were collectively necessary for the very existence of the United States. But the collectively entitled United States of America is entirely a creature of the Constitution. Not only its purpose, authority, and powers, but also its very existence have no other source. Therefore, to guarantee a republican form of government to the states ultimately entails a guarantee of the Constitution itself. In the final analysis, though, only we the people ourselves can maintain a republican form of government. A republican form of government, after all, signifies more than simply a representative government, more even than a constitutional government. Self-evidently, it prohibits every form of tyranny, as the Founding Fathers learned from John Locke, who said, Tyranny is the exercise of power beyond right, which nobody can have a right to. And this making use of the power anyone has in his hands, not for the good of those who are under it, but for his own private, separate advantage. When the governor, however intitulated, makes not the law, but his will the rule, and his commands and actions are not directed to the preservation of the properties of his people, but the satisfaction of his own ambition, revenge, covetousness, or any other irregular passion. It is a mistake to think this fault is proper only to monarchies. Other forms of government are liable to it as well as that. For wherever the power that is put in any hands for the government of the people and the preservation of their properties is applied to other ends and made use of to impoverish, harass, or subdue them to the arbitrary and irregular commands of those that have it, there it presently becomes tyranny, whether those that thus use it are one or many. Because tyranny is the exercise of power by the authorities for other than the common good, a republican form of government must subordinate to the authorities what the authorities may imagine is good for themselves and their clients to what is truly good for we the people as a whole. And in the final analysis, what is truly good for the people as a whole, only the people ourselves can judge, because we alone possess the necessary information and can be relied upon to evaluate it from the proper perspective. In addition to outright tyranny, headed by a Caesar or by a Cromwell, a republican form of government also precludes all other oligarchic schemes, such as were inherent in the British aristocracy with which the Founding Fathers were familiar, and with which they kept from gaining any foothold in America by prohibiting the United States collectively 
and every state individually from granting any title of nobility and of whatever substance. Beyond formal titles of nobility, a republican form of government excludes as well every practical badge and incident of political elitism, particularly the reactionary notion of superordination and subordination that elevates the authorities above the masses. A republican form of government always subjects the authorities to the people, never the people to the authorities. In sum, a republican form of government exists only when we the people ourselves actually, affirmatively, and authoritatively rule our own country, so that we can fully enjoy the preservation of our properties. Thus, because homeland security cannot secure less than the Constitution requires, and because the Constitution requires a republican form of government in every state of the Union, Homeland security requires that we, the people ourselves, assert control over this country whenever our representatives utterly neglect, fail, or refuse to provide constitutional leadership. And four, the preservation of a republican form of government in each of the states as individual political communities and in their more perfect union as a whole aims first and foremost at we, the people's security not at the security of any domestic office holders or politicians, political parties, or special interest groups, and most certainly not the security of any foreign countries, supranational organizations, or New World Order. After all, we the people created this Constitution for the United States of America and no other country. The Constitution is the supreme law of the land that is, the land composing the United States. And inasmuch as a law has no practical purpose for a territory barren of population, the land must be identified with we the people who inhabit it and infuse it with character and purpose. In addition, we the people have directed every exercise of power under aegis of the Constitution to the common defense, the general welfare and the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity not to the defense, welfare, or license of selfish domestic factions or alien interests. So, because we the people's own personal self-preservation and independent political community are at stake where homeland security is concerned, of course we can, in the exercise of our own rational self-interests, should and must assert an absolute right to self-defense unencumbered by either the machinations of domestic political schemers or the intrigues and influence of foreign powers. As Blackstone taught, self-defense, as it is justly called the primary law of nature, so it is not, neither can it be, in fact, taken away by the law of society. On like grounds, the Declaration of Independence identified life as foremost among those certain unalienable rights, to secure which, not to grant, let alone take away, governments are instituted among men. And inasmuch as self-defense is necessary to preserve life, self-defense must be an unalienable right too. Therefore, Communal self-defense must be a right that we the people have reserved to and for ourselves in the Constitution. For if not so reserved, it must have been delegated to some public officials. But if delegated to them, it was necessarily taken away from the people ourselves by the law of society, which contradicts its very nature. The impossibility of that result justifies the maxim, Salus populi suprema lex or the people's health is the supreme law. 5. In her practical theology, history teaches that God favors the big battalions. If so, in principle, the battle to take the helm and chart the course of homeland security is already won. For we the people number in the hundreds of millions, whereas rogue public officials, bureaucrats, judges, and politicians and the selfish special interest groups which pull their strings can muster only a minuscule fraction of that multitude. 
Yet we the people lawfully can, and, whenever the, the situation warrants, must make ourselves masters of homeland security, and in particular, regain control over the two great powers of government that contribute most to it. Namely, the power of the sword and the power of the purse, which today we have lost control over. And not only those powers, but also every other power of constitutional governance. And this because we the people have lost control over every governmental institution. No institution any longer embodies and, espe and especially enforces we the people's authority, which establishes the Constitution as the supreme law of the land, and requires that all members of Congress and the members of the several state legislatures and all executive and judicial officers, both of the United States and of the several states, to be bound by oath and affirmation to support the Constitution to be bound by oath and affirmation to support the Constitution. Rather, public office holders have degraded the Constitution to a ceremonial and impotent anachronism, whilst under the camouflage of its provisions they daily f flout its intent, misuse its powers, and in particular evade its disabilities with impunity. Lawlessness has supplanted law under the color and forms of law. 2. No institution any longer serves the court principles of a republican form of government, where we the people are the end and the government apparatus and the political process merely the means. Rather, the interests of careers politicians, bureaucrats, and judges, controlled or influenced by errantly self-serving, avaricious, and arrogant domestic and foreign special interest groups, have become the ends and we the people have been reduced to their human resources to provide the means, not only in Churchillian blood, toil, sweat, and tears, but also, and especially, in treasure. The constitutional formula of superordination and subordination, we the people above the authorities, has been turned upside down. No institution any longer actually represents or cares about, let alone advances, we the people's true communal interests. Rather, we the people find ourselves unable either to compel office holders in the general government to establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to, to ourselves and our posterity, or to prevent them from recklessly advancing the agenda of selfish special interest groups, both foreign and domestic, which provides compelling evidence that the District of Columbia is not the seat of we the people's own government after all, but instead the lair of some alien establishment pursuing ends antagonistic to the general welfare of the people. The essence of tyranny has become the working principle of public business. And perhaps worst of all, no institution is mobilizing and organizing or in any way even calling upon we the people to cooperate amongst ourselves in order to achieve our pressing communi communal goal of homeland security. Rather, at the national, state, and even local levels, we the people are increasingly being fragmented into disjointed subjects of homeland security, and thereby denied any sense of identity, integrity, and unity of purpose in that endeavor. This is not accidental. The centralized bureaucratic political regime into which all of America's governmental institutions are rapidly degenerating cannot abide a national community of patriots who are aware of their own legal authority historic mission, and overwhelming strength in numbers. Even less in the face of such a community could globalists ever hope to amalgamate America with Canada and Mexico in some North American Union, or to absorb her in some Western Hemispheric Collective 
jury rigged out of every country from Cape Richards to Cape Horn, to Cape Horn, or to, ens or to ensnare her within the toils of some New World Order or One World Government. We the People's exclusion from homeland security is intended to strike the Declaration of Independence from the, from the course of human events. Perhaps worst of all, especially in the area of homeland security, those perpetrating these outrages apparently feel fear no personal or even political consequences. For an egregious example, when the inception of the present military incursion of Iraq was being debated in the International Relations Committee of the House of Representatives, Representative Ron Paul, Republican of Texas, offered an amendment in the nature of a substitute for House, for House Joint Resolution Number 114, seeking an explicit declaration of war against Iraq in the form of the declaration of war Congress employed against, I against Japan in 1941. This not because he favored such a course of action. In fact, he strongly opposed it on constitutional and policy grounds. But in order at least to focus congressmen's attention on their constitutional responsibilities, and to preserve Congress's constitutional authority against encroachment by the President. The chairman of the committee, Representative Henry Hyde, rebuffed Representative Paul, however, asserting that the Constitution's express delegation to Congress of the power to declare war was one of those things no longer relevant to a, no longer relevant to a modern society and was inappropriate and anachronistic as a, pre as a prerequisite to an actual armed invasion of a sovereign foreign nation. Not to be outdone, the ranking minority member of the committee, Representative Tom Lantos, Democrat of California, even dismissed Representative Paul's amendments as a frivolous proposal making the rejection and ridicule of the amendment and of the con constitutional provision of which it rested bipartisan. And this, even though no one on the committee disagreed with Representative Edward Royce, Republican of California, that the resolution permits the president to wage war. During the event, Congress as a whole agreed with Representatives Hyde and Lantos because it issued no declaration of war, but instead supinely acquiesced to George W. Bush's claim that the commander-in-chief enjoys some species of inherent authority to launch as well as to conduct such an operation, which was, which was adopted into a joint resolution, which states the following. The President is authorized to use the armed forces of the United States as he determines to be necessary in order to, one, defend the national security of the United States against the continuing threat posed by Iraq, and two, enforce all relevant United Nations Security Council resolutions against Iraq. Having been a chairman of the House Judiciary Committee, Representative Hyde ought to have known that, far from a hoary anachronism, the power of Congress to declare war is one of the most important structural elements of the Constitution, and can be disregarded only at the nation's and the public officials' own peril. Under pre-constitutional Anglo-American imperial law, the King, not the Parliament, enjoyed the sole prerogative of making war and peace, and acted as Generalissimo, or the first in military command within the Kingdom. And, exercised, and he exercised the sole power of raising and regulating fleets and armies, and the sole supreme government in command of the militia. But other than the office of commander-in-chief of the Army and Navy of the United States, and of the militia of the several states, when called, when called into actual service of the United States, the Constitution denies the President the executive in the American Republic analogous to the king in the British monarchy, all of his authority, and assigns it instead exclusively to Congress.
The king's sole power of raising and regulating fleets and armies became the congressional powers to raise and support armies. To provide and maintain a navy, and to make rules for the government and regulation of the land and naval forces. And the king's sole supreme government of the militia became the congressional powers, to provide for the calling forth of the militia to execute the laws of the Union to suppress insurrections and repel invasions, and to provide for organizing, arming, and disciplining the militia and for governing such parts of them as may be employed in the service of the United States. Thus, rather than constituting some all-embracing authority that elevates the president to the level of some dictator over the United States as a whole, but absolves him of responsibility to anyone other than himself, and withal render, renders inappropriate and anachronistic Congress's power to declare war, the office of commander-in-chief amounts merely to the thinnest residue of prerogatives the British king enjoyed. The president is commander-in-chief of the army and navy of the United States, but is always subject to the power of Congress to make rules for the government and regulation of the land and naval forces and Congress can make no such rules that violate the Constitution. The President is Commander-in-Chief of the Militia of the several states, when called into actual service of the United States, but is always subject to the power of Congress to provide for organizing, arming, and disciplining the militia, and for governing such part of them as, mu as may be employed in the service of the United States, and may take up his authority only after Congress has exercised its power to provide for calling forth the militia to execute the laws of the Union, suppress insurrections, and repel invasions. The President is Commander-in-Chief of nothing else. For the powers actually granted by the Constitution to any branch of the general government must be such as are expressly given, or given by necessary implication. The President possesses no power not derived from the Constitution. Consequently, powers not granted are prohibited. And overall, as part of his duty to take care that the laws are faithfully executed, the President must conform to each and every one of these limitations on his office. Self-evidently, the Founding Fathers did not engage in this radical departure from Anglo-American legal tradition simply for the sake of novelty or sport. For it cannot be presumed that any clause in the Constitution is intended to be without effect. Rather, the Founders sought to ensure that the determination for or against war, on which decision the lives or deaths of countless citizens and even of the nation as a whole might depend, should always remain in the hands of a large, diverse body of legislators who would serve as checks and balances on each other, not in the hands of a single executive officer who could even prove to be psychologically imbalanced. Plainly, too, Congress may not delegate, let alone abdicate, to the President the power to declare war or unilaterally exercise any other related power. First, in general, by their very placement in the Constitution, these powers are legislative powers, vested in Congress, not executive power, and that Congress cannot delegate legislative power to the President is a principle universally recognized as vital to the integrity and maintenance of the system of government ordained by the Constitution, namely a free republic. Second, and even more decisively, Congress may not delegate any of those particular powers to the President, because that would reverse we the people's specific determination, consciously made in the face of, and directly contrary to, centuries of pre-constitutional Anglo-American Anglo legal tradition. To remove these powers from executive jurisdiction and transfer, them to, and transfer them to legislative domain. Yet in the case of the present military incursion into Iraq, Congress purported to do just that, leaving 
to the president the discretion to initiate warfare in the operational sense, even while shrinking from declaring war in the constitutional sense. Inasmuch as congressmen presumably know the law, their failure to declare war on Iraq mounted to an admission by conduct that they could muster no convincing grounds for such a declaration, and rightly so. For the Declaration of Independence, upon which the authority of the Constitution rests, asserts that governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. Inasmuch as the Declaration refers to no other category of powers, true governments cannot exercise unjust powers, because mere men, through their consent, the sole earthly source of all rightful political authority, cannot delegate to public officials any powers inconsistent with the laws of nature and of nature's God. Therefore, the constitutional power of Congress to declare war is, at most, only a power to declare a just war, which, on principles long held by virtues of the law of nations prior to ratifications of the Constitution, the present military incursion to Iraq arguably cannot be. For example, to invade Iraq and overthrow her legitimate, if obnoxious, government was unjustifiable in the absence of an actual attack of an actual attack upon the United States by Iraq, or any immediate, imminent danger thereof, that could not be effectively forfended by any action short of a military strike. Moreover. All other considerations aside, even if congressmen proceeded in good faith on the supposition that arguable grounds existed to deem an American military incursion into Iraq a just war, nevertheless an actual declaration of war by the sovereign power remained the necessary prerequisite. We the people are America's earthly sovereign, Congress our representative exercising the exclusive constitutional power to declare war. Therefore, without a congressional declaration of war, no premeditated attack upon Iraq or any other sovereign foreign nation could constitute a just war, because it would lack the primary indicium of justice in war, which is a prior announcement of hostilities by the sovereign or the sovereign's representative. And certainly, an aggressive preemptive strike has always been recognized to be illegal under the Constitution. After all, the preamble declares, we the people's intent to form a government in order to provide for the common defense, not to commit aggression. Similarly, the great power to lay and collect taxes is directed to paying the debts and providing for the common defense and general welfare of the United States. Providing beyond cavil that the genius and character of our institutions are peaceful, and the power to declare war was not conferred upon Congress for the purposes of aggression or aggrandizement. And even less may that power be transferred to the President for such nefarious ends. Thank you for joining us for the School of the U.S. Constitution's presentation of Dr. Edwin Vaira's book, Constitutional Homeland Security. Hope you'll join us for the next part.